Every year, hundreds of heart patients are flown by helicopter or driven by ambulance to the Prairie Heart Institute at St. John's for treatment of a heart attack or other emergency heart problem. In many cases, these patients have been diagnosed and go straight to the cath lab for treatment. But many more patients will be treated in the emergency department, which is fully staffed 24-7. This is our main emergency department. We have a 20-bed main emergency department here. Um, all private rooms except for one mm -hmm. um, all have TVs. We have a radiology department here in our emergency room right at the end of the hallway. Um, and around the corner is CAT scan, so everything is right here in the emergency department mm -hmm. um, ready to use. And, and if you have to be, uh, if you need care immediately, mm -hmm. each one of these rooms that we see that line both, both sides all the way down, they're all individual rooms. Yes, sir. Huh, interesting. Okay. So what are the folks doing that are all in, in, in the center part here? The inside part here is where our staff sits. Um, it could be our physicians sit in there, nursing staff, our procedural techs, um, our paramedics when they come in can sit in here to give report. We do have Samaritans, we have patient advocates, we have housekeepers, everybody kind of in this area um, doing work all with the same goal but lots of different things going on. Okay, this is the desk of the charge yes, nurse. Yes, our charge nurse is here. She basically oversees the entire workings of the emergency department from nursing perspective. They do assignments, you can see our assignments right here um, of which nurses are doing which rooms and which we call them pods or um, they're, they kind of oversee all that. They take phone calls, they um, help manage the traumas, they basically kind of are the nursing manager that is here during the day on the boots on the ground here helping everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's your busiest time of day or is there one? Um, typically mid-afternoon to evening is, our, is the typical busiest time mm -hmm. of the day. That's when household accidents occur or mm -hmm. automobile accidents or those kinds of things? Is that what brings yeah, people it's, here mostly? It's typically just, it's the time of day that most people are awake, so if they're not feeling well, if something's going mm -hmm. on, they tend to come in, doctor's offices, send patients in if they've made doctor's appointments and, and people, they feel like it's a little more than what they can do in the office, they'll send them in here. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, traumas happen 24-7. Um, the bulk of our traumas aren't necessarily during the day. They're more in the evenings and nights. Three rooms are set aside and specially equipped to handle trauma cases. And sometimes it gets kind of crazy in there, doesn't it? I mean, you were telling me there are times when, yeah, you're a supervisor, or you're a manager, but there are times when you become charge nurse too, right? Yes, absolutely. It's all hands on deck. And that's one thing about the emergency room everybody pitches in. So all team members pitch in. When it's the busiest, that's probably when our teams work the mm -hmm. best, and it's a well-oiled wheel. So. Yeah. There are times if we have multiple patients, we never know what's coming in. Our doors never close. We're the front door of the hospital. And so we don't know if we're getting one patient or 10 patients. Mm -hmm. And so a great example, a few months ago, we unfortunately had an accident in, around our outskirts of Springfield. 11 patients were brought to us all immediately. So my team called me and I came in and was the charge nurse. Wow. So I am wow. a nurse and yeah. still, you know, yeah. help out. And yeah. it's all hands on deck when needed. We, we have a chance now, a rare chance, because there are no patients. There's one coming in the middle of it. That, but this is the imaging room that we passed by earlier. This is this is here, is, is this part of the trauma unit? That, or is this, or would this be for anybody who just needs uh, an extra test? Yes, great question. It is strategically placed in the by the emergency room so all ER patients do have their CAT scans in this room. Mm -hmm. Other house patients if it's not being used we do bring patients down as needed. We have another CAT scanner or another two CAT scans in the main radiology department but this one is strategically placed by the trauma base by the ER yeah. to care for all trauma and ER patients. Okay. Can we walk through here? Sure. This is this is the trauma room that was dark before when we came in so we just got to get a chance to see what we didn't get a chance to see before. But um, and fortunately, these are not being used right now. But you might have, on that day when you had 11 people come in all at one time, I imagine the trauma rooms were full as well, right? Yes. Oh, man. So what we do on those days, we have two rooms that look just like where you're standing. Mm -hmm. So there's a second one, and then there's a third, what we call suture room. We can take a stable patient in that room as well. We bring all trauma patients here, and they quickly get all the care they needed. Then once stabilized, we move them on out into the main ER if it's a numerous number of mm -hmm. patients that we're getting. So all patients would come to this room or the next room or the third room mm -hmm. to start their initial care. Um, the team comes here, and then they continue to follow them in the ER as okay. well. My team of surgeons, who are all trauma surgeons, admit the patients and see them and take care of them from the time they come in from the ambulance 
you know, from the scene of mm -hmm. an accident to the time that they leave the door, mm -hmm. which is really nice. We get to see them through their entire course, see how their injuries heal, see how they recover. So in addition to you, how many surgeons are we talking about? We have a team of probably about 10 surgeons wow. who are here uh, throughout the month. Mm -hmm. um, we have excellent staff. I have probably five or six double-boarded trauma critical care surgeons mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who are absolutely the best of the best. And, you, and you've, been, uh, you've been in this position, medical director, for about six months. Yes. Do you feel like you got your feet on the ground now or you still feel new? Still finally. Feel, yeah. Finally starting to feel like I do have my feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. We have been uh, wildly successful since I've been here. I think we will continue to be successful and competitive. But most importantly, I think we take excellent care of patients as a team. Uh, that I'm really proud to be a part of. This team is, is the likes of which I have never seen before. They're absolutely fantastic. Th there's been an interesting history of trauma care in, in St. John's, in Springfield, you know, all over. The, the way the hospitals have worked together, and now the, now the way, you know, the, 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 it's new now, the new setup in the past year, St. John's has a different designation. And how, how, is that, how has that worked out? For us, it's been a process of growth over the last year. We're just at the end of our first year. And I would say in that time, we've made enormous strides. Mm -hmm. uh, not only in October were we designated as a state level one adult trauma center, mm -hmm. we're also a state level two pediatric trauma center. What that means for our patients is that if they happen to be in their minivan with their family and they are involved in a car accident, the entire family can come mm -hmm. to our hospital and get excellent state of the art medical care, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm really proud of. Our team is very proud of that. Yeah. And amid all the suffering that may accompany trauma, a special human resource is always there to help support patients and their families. We're part of the trauma team, and so when a trauma arrives, or when we hear that trauma is coming to the hospital, we are included in the loop, so to speak, and the, the pager will go off and say, uh, today, for example, the female fell downstairs, estimated time of arrival six minutes, and so whatever I'm doing, I sort of curtail my uh, my visit if I'm with another patient and, and just excuse myself to come down as soon as I can to the trauma bay. Uh, and then once the patient has arrived, they'll, they'll let us know if family has also arrived. Sometimes family is still a little bit of out, a time out because they have come from, you know, by air or by ambulance mm -hmm. from some distance. And so it takes a little while for the family to get here. In this case today, the husband had arrived fairly soon because they just came from a local priority care. Mm -hmm. And so my duty initially is to, to tend to the family uh, more than the patient and just make sure that they're comfortable, that they're informed of what's going on, you know, in a timely manner and uh, sit with them, sort of get a little bit of information from them. And sometimes I'm able to pass along to the uh, trauma team, for example, uh, the family member, loved one, spouse may say, oh, do, uh, she's on blood pressure medicine. Well, the patient may not be conscious and able to share that information. Maybe the paramedics don't know that information, so we're able to sometimes give a little bit of helpful information that way. But primarily, our focus is on uh, taking care of the family, and then only later do we really interact much with the patient. Yeah. Trauma patients usually arrive one of two ways, by ambulance or by helicopter. Flight teams are always available, and in fact, live in special quarters in St. John's Hospital. And you live in this sort of like a fireman's quarters at the hospital. <laughs> so it's kind of, it is kind of like a, a boyhood dream, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, it is. As a matter of fact, uh, when I first saw a helicopter and they were picking up a patient, I was going through, I was just getting ready to start nursing school. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what I want to do. And is that, that right? was my goal when I started So how long school. have you been doing it? Uh, I, I, now it's uh, been 25 years. Uh, no this kidding. Past November. Yes, sir. Wow. Yes, sir. So sir. you've had a silver anniversary as a flight nurse. Yes, sir. You've yeah, seen a lot of things, haven't you? Uh, Probably yes, some pretty unusual cases, I would think. Yes, sir. That, and that's the, that's the very interesting thing about this job is that it's, it's uh, so unpredictable. You never know what you're going to go for. It's just like EMS and fire. You, you sit around, you mm -hmm. wait for the call. Once you get the call, you never know what's going to happen. That's right. But boy, then for. you got to be ready. Yes, sir. Right? And, and that's, because, that's the adrenaline rush. Yeah, because you, you might have two or three days without anything, and then boom, oh, yes, and you got to go. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. It, it, Night, it, day, anytime. It, life is resting on this, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Well, we're, we, this is interesting because I didn't know that your crew has living space here at St. John's Hospital, but we're standing in your kitchen. Yes, sir. You got just about <laughs> everything you need. You got your microwave there, you got yes, your sir. coffee pot, yes, sir. the sink, and then behind, there's a, a, a refrigerator. You got your flat 
flat screen TV. Yes, sir. So I mean, <laughs> you're, you guys are all set up. <laughs> yes, sir. So do you, do you do you do you want to go home when you're on your days <laughs> off? I mean, it's kind of kind of nice. <laughs> a lot of times this becomes home away from home <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll bet because it does. we do do 24-hour shifts. Yeah. But no, it's always good to go home. Absolutely. Yeah. You, I think I mentioned. Okay, so you've really got four crews, right? You've got you've got four nurses and four EMTs, and I think you have four pilots. Yes, sir. So four paramedics and four pilots. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, paramedics. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir, and, and, and we, uh, what, what they do is they combine a pilot, a paramedic, and a nurse together, mm -hmm. and um, that's the team that's, that's here the for team. 24 hours, yes, sir. Yeah. And so you have four of those teams, so there's always, no matter what day of the year, no matter what time of the day, it's covered. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. That is if correct. you would, take us through here, because it's interesting to see how yes, you sir. guys live. Let's go that okay. way. I'll follow yes, you, okay? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, right here, uh, well, we have a table, sure. uh, so, yeah. so we have a, somewhere to sit down and eat, but we also have a bathroom. Uh, mm -hmm. You never know, a lot of times, especially in the summertime, we uh, uh, go having some of the flights that we do, I mean, we're, we're, we get, get pretty sweaty and stuff, so sometimes if sure. we have a chance, we'll jump in, jump, uh, take a shower if we need to, sure. and uh, 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 have a place to clean up and stuff. So. Yeah. 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 Well, you guys do, when, when it's work, it's hard work. When you're working, it's yes, hard sir. work. And, and that's the thing about this job is when, when you're sitting around, your, your uh, anxiety, adrenaline level is down to zero, and mm -hmm. then you get the call, and it pegs out. Oh, and then that. once you're done with that call, then you get, come back down. Yeah. You, you, you relax yeah. again. Well, you've got a place to do it. <laughs> yes, too. sir. These rooms are all the same. These are bedrooms. So yes, sir. These are there are three bedrooms, so there's, uh, you, you, you don't have to share, but at the same time, you keep it clean for the next crew coming in, right? Yes, sir. Because that is somebody correct. else is going to use Yes, sir, and, and then we have a TV in each in each room as well. Oh, okay. so, so if, if you, you want, want some quiet time, you can just and if you, you want know, some privacy, some privacy, uh, yeah. yes, sir. We take go ahead and study. take a look in there because this is uh, it, it's modest, but it's a, it's a, a very practical quarters, isn't it? Yeah. And we have a supply area, a supply okay. room Towels, where we keep sheets, all our supplies, all towel sheets, stuff. medications, IV mm -hmm. supplies, and all of that. And then we have our workspace where we actually, when we get back from a flight and we have to, there's always paperwork to do and mm -hmm. computer work to do. So when we come in here, when we get done with our flight, we come in here and, and, and we do all our, our, our computerized charting and, and everything that we need to. Right. And, and, and I, assume, I assume this also helps you like get ready for a flight because you, you get your calls and because you're a flight team. Yes, sir. It's it's not like well let's get in the car and go. There are certain certain boundaries you have to to being a flight team, aren't there? You yes, can't sir. Just that take is correct. The, for example, the FAA uh, has regulations for our pilots on when and when they can't fly, mm -hmm. and uh, so our pilots are constantly aware of what the weather's doing, uh, day or night, and so we have computers for all of that, mm -hmm. so that our pilots can easily, when the call comes in, we try to lift off within 10 minutes from the time the phone rings, and uh, so based on that, our pilots always have weather ready to check. Uh, for, the, for the whole uh, state, mm -hmm. and uh, that way they can make a quick decision of whether or not we can and can't go, depending on what the weather's yeah. doing. Yeah. In their downtime, the flight team members keep their training requirements current. These same computers provide crucial weather information. Well, the pilot will check the weather here, he'll check the forecast for the area we're going to, and he'll check the forecast for the area in between. Yeah. And then he's also going to check the forecast for later when we're when we're estimated to get back so that we know we can get back to the hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so we check the visibility and the ceilings and uh, if there's any forecasted weather um, for that area then we'll possibly not be able to take the flight because we don't want to delay the patient getting here knowing that there's a possibility we'll have to turn around. Right. When patients get to the hospital they're treated with increasingly advanced methods and devices. One of the challenges of modern medicine is staying in the vanguard of change and development. Continuing medical education is always a must, and technology is helping doctors incorporate it into their practice. On my phone, I have an app that the hospital St. John's provides me called UpToDate. So let's, see, I, let's say I see a patient with a novel condition or something that I don't see every day. Mm -hmm. So I go to this app called Up to Date, and I hit it, and let me see if I can find the app. I, there it is, Up to Date. Mm -hmm. I hit it, and let's say I'm seeing a patient, and they have something called pulmonary hypertension. I don't see that every day. Pulmonary, I gotta be able to spell it, pulmonary uh, well, let's do pulmonary embolism, okay. blood clot to the lungs. So I pull it up, 
and it has a whole bunch of search results. And so I want a quick overview before I go see this patient who's in intensive care mm -hmm. unit. So I hit overview of treatment, and it gives me a whole list of important uh, data, including a summary and recommendations. Now, in the old days, I'd have to go to the library. I might have to go to a conference. None of this helps me when I'm faced with a patient that I haven't treated for a while, mm -hmm. right then and there. So I can learn everything I or can refresh my memory. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of this, I can actually submit the learning that I've done for continuing medical education credits. And so they calculate how much time it mm -hmm. took to do this, and they would give me one hour of CME. But the point is not just how neat this is that I can do this, and let me tell you, we do this not infrequently, and it's not just neat that I can get an hour of CME. What's the neat part is that I've incorporated continuing medical education into my daily routine. And I think that's what's really important about CME and being a professional is that you don't let questions go unanswered until the next conference you go to because you don't know when you're going to be able to go to the next right. conference. You don't know what family emergency I have to attend to. I am obligated by law in Illinois to get 40 hours of CME a year. I bet in our practice and across the city, um, there are people who literally get you know double that, mm -hmm. triple hours of CME, uh, may not log at all, but you're always asking questions as part of your professional career and always looking for the latest in knowledge to make sure that you're up to date, which is the name of the mm -hmm. app. In a more conventional approach to continuing medical education, on Friday mornings, PERC, the education and research arm of Prairie Heart Institute, offers a variety of presentations. So today we talked about the TeleHeart program and how the Minneapolis Heart Institute does their program and he's sharing his knowledge with us so that we can maybe find ways within our system to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So every every day almost every friday Correct. during the season you do 40 mm -hmm. some out of these a year yes how do you choose the subject matter that you're going to that you're going to uh, present we let our physicians choose the subject matter and that's the way we get there in their wheelhouse so they are the innovators in their field so that when they come to us they give us the topics and then they're able to present to the staff and colleagues around the area mm -hmm. so they're the really the leaders in the content planning for this year for instance uh, what are some of the examples of some of the conferences that the doctors and nurses here have been subjected to so we have everything from heart failure specific, we've got vascular specific, structural heart um, courses, we've got echo specific credit we also give. So we try to give a very big variety so that the people that are attending can get a variety of education within, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. within the conferences. And then of course doctors and nurses are expected to have a, a certain amount of continuing medical education and this right. goes toward that, they get credit for this. It then, does, right? it does. Um, with their licensure structure we require so many hours per year and so this helps put towards those hours. Mm -hmm. Are you already planning next year's? We are. We've actually <laughs> scheduled out January and February. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Um, it, it, anything, uh, anything sort of brand new coming down, down the way? Um, we've always got innovative ideas. We've got a lot of innovators here at Prairie, so we are just filled with knowledge, and it's great to be able to share that with the community members and with people in the hospital system. And, and, and it's worth noting, too, that, that the doctors and nurses that are here, they're not just St. John's and Prairie docs and nurses, are they? It's open to, it's open to other prof professionals as Correct. well. Correct. Yeah, we open it up to both main hospitals here in Springfield and anyone else in the healthcare field that's able to attend. Yeah. On this morning, Dr. Mark Newell, a cardiologist from Minnesota, describes a program that speeds the diagnoses of heart problems of patients in rural areas. A matter of great interest here, because Prairie has been studying and responding to this issue for years with its STAT Heart program. So TeleHeart is a remote visit program or a virtual visit program where we actually um, see patients that are in their rural communities. They stay in their communities and the cardiologist stays in the metro area and they're actually able to connect up for a face-to-face -face visit over video. And so they can do a cardiology consultation while the patient stays in their home. And while we stay in the Twin Cities, it allows them access to care that they didn't have before um, and more frequent access to care. It allows the providers that they work with in their rural communities the opportunity to be able to have more access to specialists. It allows us the opportunity, of course, to be more efficient and still do things downtown and also expand our ability to see places, you know, see people yeah. different places. So now, now, how is this different from just having a Skype 
visit, for instance? Yeah, it's it's a similar concept actually. It's just that you need in healthcare, of course, to have the privacy compliant part of it. It needs to be what's called HIPAA compliant, so oh, okay. nobody else can get into that All that right. visit. Mm -hmm. And so the privacy component of it, and of course the the official credentialing part of it. You know, somebody that. Um, is at home, can they do their own blood pressure, can they do their own vitals, can they review their meds? Those are some of the real world issues that come up. So this is done in a clinic setting, but it's done in the rural clinic, and then they're connected to the Metro Oh, they're not the coming, to, coming to you from home, they're in a rural they're clinic. They're in a rural clinic. Okay. So they get checked in, they do a typical, right. what looks like a clinic visit for their local site, mm -hmm. but then they're being connected to us through their clinic. Right. Now eventually we may get to the point where they'll be sitting on their couch. Yeah. Now I don't know if, you're, if your service area is like this, but we're very rural. Yep. And, and as you know, these, these doctors here, they go to clinics all over central Illinois. So right. a lot of times, it, you're right, these folks, they can't just get here every time they feel like they need to see the doctor. Right. And that's the key. I think, you know, Prairie Heart covers a big area. And yeah. You're right. They're an innovative, great group. And a lot of rural areas, just like we have, we go to 40 sites and throughout Minnesota and Wisconsin. And so we're covering places that are three hours from our, our main hub. Mm -hmm. And so those patients, I think we underestimate how often they're making the decisions themselves or that local provider is making the decision of do they really need to go or not because we're three hours away. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, the cardiologist won't be here for another week or two or whatever right. it may be. And so that patient or that doctor in the rural community is making the decision, well, is my chest pain that bad? Do I really need to come in? Mm -hmm. Where that really shouldn't be the way the world works. It should yeah. be that if they've got a problem, they can get access to the specialist that they need and this is a way to do that. Our research mission has evolved beyond just um, participating in trials. It uh, also includes um, investigator originated studies focused starting here and also uh, we've developed uh, research competencies where companies actually seek us out to run their research trials and um, for instance on the peripheral arterial side PERC runs a uh, peripheral arterial circulation um, analysis laboratories where they take films, uh, procedures that are done uh, across the country and across the world actually and analyze them uh, as to their results and that's part of the data set that's used in ongoing research studies. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of people haven't heard of PERC, they don't know exactly what PERC does, but, but you're convinced that PERC is a great asset to this community. Why is that? <laughs> Well, first of all, I think any organization that's dedicated to research is an asset to a community because um, research attracts bright minds, and bright minds is what every community needs to uh, flourish. So um, a perk is like watering a garden. It's a, it, it attracts people. Um, and research, uh, the ability to offer cutting edge technologies through our research cooperative, cooperative allows us to attract young talent to Springfield, uh, young aggressive cardiologists who are interested in being pioneers over the next 20 or 30 years and, and sharing the skills. So um, for us, it, it's really, in, it, it allows us to express ourselves in ways other than just practicing medicine. It's, it's almost like the artistic side of medicine. It allows us the ability to participate in larger national trials, um, get to know national and international cardiology figures, um, cross-pollinate. All of these things are done through research organizations. A good example is the Prairie Vascular Fellowship, supervised by Dr. Jeffrey Goldstein. Well, the Prairie Vascular Fellowship is uh, what we call a super fellowship. So this is a fellowship that trains physicians that have already finished their traditional training. So to explain, you know, tra traditional cardiology training, interventional cardiology fellowship is very good at teaching the basics of cardiology and interventional cardiology. But as you've seen through your show, a lot of the procedures we do are advanced. And that, uh, the problem with the current training that we have uh, with cardiologists is that they don't get a lot of exposure to that advanced training. Mm -hmm. So these uh, physicians, they come out of their training, they're looking for extra training in more advanced procedure like the structural heart procedures we've seen or the mm -hmm. vascular procedures. Uh, this is one of the few fellowships in the country where they can come 
spend a year and then train in those advanced procedures. Mm -hmm. And then in, for him working here, or, or him or her working here, they're paid a salary, is that yes. right? Okay. Yeah. Plus, they, they're, they're there for you for, to be your assistant as well, I guess. Yeah. So we've, uh, we've literally had physicians from around the world apply to do the fellowship with us. Now, uh, due to licensing uh, restrictions, we can only accept physicians that have trained within the United States. But, uh, for instance, we have about 12 to 15 physicians that, tr that apply uh, for one position. Mm -hmm. uh, we award a fellowship to one physician and they train with us for a year. Well, you know, it's, it sounds like a good deal to the institution this, these people work for, too, because they take new skills back with them, don't they? Right, right. So we've had physicians that this has really tr changed the trajectory of their career, you know, they were on a path like this and they mm -hmm. go home after training with us and have really trained, changed their careers. Uh, we have physicians that are in the middle of their career and have changed the pathway of, of where they're going because of uh, the new procedures they mm -hmm. can do. Um, at this time, we're really focusing on the younger physician, the physician right out of training. What can we do with them to train them for, you know, contemporary mm -hmm. interventional cardiology practice? Yeah. There are so less than so five places in the country so where you can have so so where you have interventional cardiology do so so this vast spectrum of endovascular procedures mm -hmm. and they're open to training so right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that makes so, so prairie cardiology unique you so what we do here at prairie and in terms of the scope of practice uh, expands over cardiology, vascular surgery, interventional radiology, and cardiothoracic mm -hmm. surgery mm -hmm. at most hospitals. Yeah, that's quite an opportunity. Yeah, so, so that was the yeah. that was the attraction, and that because mm -hmm. it, it's almost impossible to go out and get trained in structural heart disease, endovascular aneurysm repair, lower extremity PAD, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that too within a year. This is an opportunity to pass advanced knowledge on to a new generation. One example among hundreds that point to the remarkable progress we have seen in recent years in treating the ailments of the human heart.